You know how when you're looking for your keys and you search up and down for them and you check all of your pockets and you go out to the car and you check in there, you check the washing machine and then eventually you find them and you say, they're always in the last place you look. Well, yeah, of course, they're in the last place because once you've found them, you don't keep looking. And that's exactly like hitting an alcoholic rock bottom. <laughs> because once you've hit an alcoholic rock bottom, you don't keep looking, do you? Brothers, sisters, comrades and friends, welcome to Bat Country. I woke up once strapped to a bed in a psych ward. I'd been pulled out of my apartment by the police, a group of tough looking, square jawed, handsome German cops. I don't remember the exact circumstances which led to that, but someone had called in a wellness check on me after I was two weeks into a particularly suicidal relapse binge. I remember the fight with the cops. I've had a few. And I remember that one. In the process of, of, of detaining me, they broke my ribs. If you train martial arts long enough, it kind of becomes muscle memory, which means you can do it even when you're semi-conscious, as I was that day. And I was able to resist. And uh, while I was being pinned to the ground, one of the cops put his knee in my ribs and caused a couple of them to break. And then after that, I remember being a, being a problem on the psych ward when I arrived. I remember squaring up to the orderlies and being belligerent until eventually I was restrained and tied to the bed. And I remember that night, restrained on my back with my hands to the side of the bed, desperately needing a pee, uh, an orderly had to hold my dick while I peed into a bottle. And after he'd left, after he'd, after he'd finished doing it, I remember crying uh, how pathetic I was. Over time, I began to calm down and sober up a little bit, and I was given quite a large room to myself in this psych ward. Uh, the psych ward is, is called Friedrich von Bodelschwing Clinic. Uh, Bodelschwing to its, to its friends, and by friends I mean inmates. I'd heard of the place before I arrived. In the local Facebook group that I was in, in Berlin, on my street there was a schizophrenic guy and he used that local Facebook page to vent about his awful treatment at the hands of the medical staff at Bödelschwing. Uh, he accused them of working for the government against him and, and giving him psychoactive drugs in order to make him to confess to crimes he hadn't committed and that kind of thing. Deeply paranoid stuff. And then that day, it was me. It was me in that ward. And it was me having those paranoid delusions. And I was the one thinking that conspiratorial stuff. I remember looking out of the window of that big room I had to myself. My head still spinning from alcohol withdrawal and from diazepam. As this big, dense storm, thunderstorm, rolled in over the city. The lightning cracking over the over our heads and making the windows rattle the rain sheeting down in thick columns you could see it kind of in dark pillars moving across the ground and as it rolled in as it began to intensify i looked down into the courtyard this kind of grassy space that was enclosed on all sides and supposed to be a kind of zen and restful place for the inmates a young woman ran out into that courtyard in the, in the pouring rain. She was immediately drenched and she stood in the open ground and threw her hands up and she begged God to strike her with lightning. She begged God to kill her. And I thought to myself in a moment of clarity, what's going to be worse for that young woman? Is it going to be worse if God kills her today? Or... Is it going to be worse if he doesn't? And then I realized I can't possibly be in a worse place than this. 
How did I get to this place with all of the things that I've done and the cool shit that I've seen in my life? How did I end up here, strapped, recently strapped to a hospital gurney after fighting with the cops in which I'd suffered broken ribs in a psych ward in a foreign country, surrounded by all these crazy people doing crazy things? This is it. I thought while I was there, this is my rock bottom. I have to get out. I am not like these people. And we all have those thoughts in those places. We all think we're not like the people in them. But when we're in them, we are those people. And that day, somehow I snuck out. I managed to, I'm not sure how, it was a closed space. You weren't allowed to leave the ward, but somehow I talked my way off it for a moment and I left and didn't come back. What I actually did was I went across the road to an Asian supermarket and I bought a bottle of Baiju. And Baiju, if you're not familiar with it, it's a very, very strong Chinese spirit liquor. I used to drink it when I lived in China because it's just so strong. I was drunk within 15 minutes and then within a few days, I was back on that psych ward again. I'd had another rock bottom, equally as bad, and I was just taken straight back to that ward. And it didn't stop there. It took several rock bottoms for me. There were still many more rock bottoms to be found underneath that one. Unfortunately, I took it upon myself to dig. Today, the memories I have of that ward, which I was on four or five times, I think. They bring me a lot of pain. And sometimes it feels like somebody else's memories has they've been implanted into my mind. And I struggle to understand how that guy, that rock bottom guy, is the same guy as this guy. But here's the really weird thing. I'm grateful that those memories hurt. I'm grateful for the pain they bring me because I am exactly the kind of person who needs those memories. In my alcoholism, there was never any chance, not a chance ever, that I would be able to control it. It is out of the question for me. What I mean is there was, there was never a moment before I started getting sober when I even considered that I needed to get sober. It's hard to explain, but what matters is that moderate drinking or social drinking was never and will never be an option for me. For me, it's hardcore sobriety to the point where it defines my entire life or it's death. No middle ground, no compromise, no healthy moderation. It's sobriety or death for me. And the pain of the rock bottoms through which I have put myself are motivation today. Those repeated rock bottoms, those are the foundations on which I have rebuilt my sober life. So why am I telling you this today? Okay, so behind the scenes here at Bat Country, I have found myself having a very similar conversation with a number of long-term sober people about almost exactly the same thing, completely independently of each other. Oh, did you hear that? That was my chest. That, that was the broken rib. And these conversations regard an opinion that some of us share. It's an opinion, a controversial one, I think is safe to say, which some of us in alcohol recovery kind of whisper to each other in darkened corners and in the smoking areas outside AA rooms and in invite-only long-term sobriety WhatsApp groups and that kind of thing. But we don't talk about it publicly because the opinion, well, it's dangerous. And the opinion is this. Some people won't get sober until they've really had a rock bottom. Some people need a rock bottom. That is the opinion. To get sober, some people need to lose everything, come close to death, have good sense beaten into them by some terrible and destructive experience. And we don't say that publicly because it feels like bad advice at best and it feels 
dangerous at worst. Telling someone who's struggling with their sobriety, someone who's struggling with alcohol, that the reason they can't get sober is because they haven't yet hit rock bottom is like giving them permission to drink. It's a wildly irresponsible thing to say. And yet here I am. And if it's not like giving someone permission to drink, it's a little bit like dismissing their their condition entirely. Like saying, no, you don't need help yet. And it's very patronizing. In fact, I, I think there is a bit of snobbery in recovery groups, especially about younger people or about people who are new to sobriety. Those of us who have been sober a while, we don't really take them seriously until they've had a rock-bottom horror story. And that's not fair. And there's, there's a, a big amount of snobbery in that opinion, and I'm still guilty of it now, even though I'm aware of it. I, I try to do better, but I'm 39, and I was an alcoholic for a long time. And I was in jail, and I was, you know, I had all, the, all these terrible experiences. And when a 19-year-old in the rooms says, like, well, I feel like I've lost control because... I've started missing school because of my drinking. I can't help myself thinking, you, you haven't seen the worst of it yet. And it's a real snobby because anybody, anybody who's trying to help themselves should be welcomed. I'm getting sidetracked. So is it true? Do alcoholics need to hit rock bottom in order to get sober? I'll share a couple of perspectives, I think, for this in starting with my own. This is what I think about the question of whether a rock bottom is really necessary for alcoholics based on only on my own journey. So looking back at my own drinking, I consider myself profoundly lucky that my alcoholism was as bad as it was. What an absolute blessing it is to me that I had it so bad that I nearly died. I'm glad. I'm happy that my alcoholism was nearly fatal. I'm glad it tried to kill me. I wish it had never I wish it had never happened. I wish none of it had I wish I had never had a problem. But since I did, I am at least grateful that it was the worst that it could possibly be. Being fatal was the best thing that alcoholism could have been for me because it forced me to get my shit together or to get dead. I am 100% convinced that if I was a less suicidal drinker by even one degree, I would not be sober today. I would be forever circling that drain, drinking badly enough that I was always miserable, but never so bad that I actually quit. I'd be stuck in it until it killed me. Perhaps more slowly, perhaps I'm, I may have met my end more slowly, but probably just as painfully. I'd always be in the trap of thinking I could drink moderately. And I would be chasing that lie until my life, foreshortened by alcohol, came to a very lonely and anonymous end. Now it's a terrible shame that I nearly took everyone who loved me down with me in the process. And I'm sorry for that. And I'll be sorry about that forever. I have a lot of emotional debt to repay at some point. And I am humblingly, undeservedly, inexplicably lucky that I hit that wall before lasting liver and organ damage was done. Somehow I escaped that. And honestly, I can't explain it. Uh, I watch a lot of our friend liver disease, LD's channel in the description. Uh, if you don't know who that is, I'm sure you do. And watching him talk about his alcoholism, it makes me reflect on my own. And I wonder sometimes how close I must have come because as far as I can tell, I was at least keeping up with, with his drinking. And somehow I dodged it, and I, I have no explanation for that. 
But for me, in terms of my own journey, is a rock bottom necessary for an alcoholic to get sober? I had to hit that wall, man. I had to hit it. For me, yes, it was necessary. The rock bottom was and remains necessary. And that's because, like a, like a lot of other addicts, I imagine some of you fall into this category too. My personality is one of extremes. I'm either eating takeaway and, and Haribo and never leaving the bed, or I'm eating celery for breakfast and going to the gym twice a day. I'm either convincing myself that capitalism is the root of all of the world's unhappiness, or I'm trying to get as rich as possible as quickly as possible. <laughs> and failing. And this YouTube channel is proof of that fact. I am either an absolutely hopeless, suicidal alcoholic, or I am the soberest person in the world. I'm either, I'm either the most drunk or the most sober. There is no middle ground for me or for people like me. It's either engine off or it's foot on the floor a million miles an hour. So alcohol was either going to kill me or it was going to save me. In the end, it was kind of both. I like to think of it more like, e like <laughs> in the end, either I was going to kill myself or I was going to save myself. Nothing in between. Those rock bottoms that I hit, and I hit many, they are why I am sober today. That young woman who was begging God to strike her dead with lightning, she is why I am sober today. So that's my perspective. Rock bottom was necessary for me. Now, so let's, let's look at some other perspectives for a moment. I was speaking to a social worker the other day, and he, he wasn't a sober person himself, but he worked with addicts of all stripes. And I'm going to paraphrase him to communicate his position on this. He said that there was a blessing in disguise in alcohol versus other addictive chemicals. And that's the tendency of alcohol to be incredibly volatile. With alcohol more than other drugs, the lie that we tell ourselves that we are escaping our problems becomes unstable faster with alcohol rather than other chemicals. In other words, alcohol is more destructive, more destabilizing, more quickly. And with that comes more crisis points, at which point useful intervention is possible. In, in his words, more rock bottoms means more chances. Hitting a hard rock bottom is an opportunity for salvation. Okay, so that's the social worker's position. That's, that's the other perspective. And I find it to reinforce my own. What he is saying is that the more rock bottoms there are, the more opportunities there are to do something. And I couldn't have expressed my own opinion better than that. So thank you to the, the person who told me that if you're, if you're watching. And unfortunately, that is how I feel. As dangerous as it feels to say out loud and as nervous as I am to read the comments on this video after I publish it, I believe that for people with a personality type like mine, a rock bottom is always a bad thing, but is often a crucial thing. When you're at your lowest and you know it, you know it because you don't want it anymore. And then there's a glimmer of hope for you. Feeling terrible is a desire to not feel terrible. Feeling pain is a desire to not feel pain. And when that happens, it is possible to, to take action, to take the action required to stop it. But despite that being my avowed position, someone in my emails added to that thought. I won't name the person, um, you know who you are, if you, I know you're watching, so you're listening. Uh, but he said about this opinion that I just shared, that sometimes it's necessary to have a rock bottom. His point was that having that opinion 
can make us, as sober people, feel guilty. Because it implies that somebody's problem has to get worse before it gets better. And that... That's not, not a good message for people in early sobriety, or in late alcoholism, I suppose. That message can be a barrier for people to get help. So, the flip side, an alternative perspective. Is it possible to get sober without a rock bottom? Yes. You don't have to wait for the walls to come crushing in on you, like they did for me and like for so many others. You don't have to walk right up to the line of your own mortality in order to recognise that a change must be made. Without question, the most important factor is that you recognise that you are at an inflection point. You're at a, at a crossroads in your drinking and you must be willing to make the necessary difficult changes if you want to beat this thing before you hit a wildly destructive rock bottom. You have to be willing. A rock bottom, unfortunately, might make you more willing, but if you were a strong-willed person to start with, then you stand a better chance of getting out before it gets worse. Maybe you're there right now. I suspect some of you are, because here's the thing. How do I phrase this? There are only three groups of people watching this video right now. There are people like me, who have got sober, been sober a while, and watched these things as a kind of refresher. Then there are people who are trying to quit right now, and are looking for either motivation or for information from people with more experience than them. And then there is the third group. The people who haven't perhaps yet admitted to themselves fully that they have a problem, and perhaps they need someone to tell them that they have a problem. There are no there are no moderate drinkers watching sober YouTube for entertainment value. There are no passengers on a channel like this. So if you are in that third group, I may as well be the one to tell you. Hey, get your shit together. You have a drinking problem. You know how I know? Because you're watching this. Now's the time. That the time is now for you. That little doubt in your mind, that, that suspicion you have about your own drinking, that led you to seek out this video, that's not morbid curiosity. That is your body telling you it is time to get a handle on this thing. So just do it. You want to stop. Even if you don't know you want to stop. You want to stop. I know you do. That's why you're here. So, over to you, gentle viewer. What's your opinion on this? Do people need to hit a rock bottom? Is the idea of a rock bottom artificial? How do we know what a rock bottom is? Whatever opinion you have, advice you want to give, experience you want to share, leave it in the comments and subscribe. And as always, Good luck out there.